good morning, everyone. Today we are starting the activities of the workshop on embodied cognition and the initiative of the research group on semantics and ontology that I coordinate at the philosophy graduate program at UNICINO. Last year, due to new lines of research that have started in this program, I participated in a project in the area of humanities in which I contribute along with colleagues from education and linguistics with the planning of a cognitive science lab. The funds were granted by FINEP and we are waiting in its release in order to set up the equipment and start the researches at the lab. This workshop is part of the activities linked to the new line of research that is being developed. This line aims to undertake theoretical studies of the human mind and also examine these studies through a more empirical research of human of, sorry, by the investigation of perception, for instance, visual perception, by the research of attention and its conceptual dependency, by the investigation of the relationship between words and perceptions, by the research of the emotional involvement that occurs in handling activities and in naming of objects and so on. The opportunity of this workshop has my, was my participation in another workshop on embodied cognition at the University of Pittsburgh in the Center for Philosophy of Science, organized by Edward Macri, in which Larry Shapiro presented about embodiment of concepts. We are very pleased to have Larry here today presenting conclusions of his latest book about embodiment of cognition and exchanging ideas. If you enter Larry's site, you will see the diversity of topics and in philosophy of mind approached by him. From classic themes such as Davidson's anomalous monuments to discussions about recent findings on the notion of biological function in semantics, evolutionary, psychology, multiple realization, functionalism, causal exclusion, epiphenomenalism, and recent theories of representation. Larry is a philosophy professor at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. In the book Embodied Cognition released this year, the first introductory book to this new field in cognitive sciences, which, according to some, as Larry explains, is the future of cognitive sciences, Larry seeks to weigh the arguments for and against this new trend. The perspective of embodiment, embodiment also takes Larry in his book, The Mind Incarnate, from 2004, to address critically the functionalist idea that minds can exist independently of bodies. He also edited with Bree Gentler in 2007 an anthology on philosophy of mind arguing about the mind whose uniqueness lies in placing side by side the classical questions of philosophy of mind and new issues related to empirical research in neuroscience, animal cognition, and psychopathology. I am very grateful to Larry for having faced a long and tiresome trip so as to be within us today, helping us to enlighten some difficult philosophical issues in a multidisciplinary field. This workshop will continue during this afternoon and also tomorrow, Wednesday in the afternoon and in the evening. The closing conference at 19.30 tomorrow, Mental Manipulation and Problem of Causal Exclusion by Larry Shapiro, is also part of the activities to celebrate 10 years of our graduate philosophy program at Nicino. 
I want also to thank Flavio Kapicinski from the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul, Carlos Ferraz from the Federal University of Pelotas, and Adriano Brito and Marco Azevedo from Municinos for having accepted the invitation to present and discuss issues about embodiment in the field of philosophy and of neuroscience, especially in the case of Flavio in the field of empirical psychiatry. Under my auspicious, the graduate students Haroldo Dagel, Cecilia Casal, and Deborah Fontora made it possible to free up tomorrow's conference in Portuguese. The workshop had the financial support of the philosophy graduate program of the unit, of the unit for research and graduate programs and of the philosophy undergraduate course of Unicinos. Finally, I thank all participants some of which have come from other states to be part of our debate. To all us, a productive and interesting workshop. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. I'd like to thank Sophia and Unisos for having me here. It was a thrill to be here. I've never been to Brazil before. I've never been to South America, and so this is a real uh, unique experience for me. I'd like to talk today about embodied cognition and the um, new conception of mind that people in embodied cognition uh, are presenting us with. And to begin that, I thought I'd contrast uh, the classical approach to understanding minds that has been prevalent since the 1950s or the 1960s uh, to embodied cognition. And one uh, theme that will be running through my presentation is uh, the question whether and to the, the extent to which embodied cognition is actually offering a challenge to the traditional conception of mind, which I conceive of as being the computational conception of mind, and the extent to which uh, they're simply offering us insights that might be incorporated by this more traditional conception of mind. Uh, so, this is where I'm from. I don't live there, but uh, the capital of Wisconsin. Uh, and now I'd like to begin uh, to talk a little bit about the computational theory of mind that embodied cognition is is challenging and, uh, in some sense, trying to supplant. So according to this view, minds are like computers. Uh, so we have cognitive processes that have a determinate starting point and a determinate end point. And what cognition involves is um, taking information from the environment through our sensory organs and embellishing it in some way, uh, manipulating it, and computing outputs on the basis of these informational states that are inputs. And the information is conceived of as being contained in symbols. So the mind is a symbol processor, just like a computer is. And on this conception of what minds are, minds are insulated from the world, and they're insulated from the body, just as uh, the CPU in your computer is insulated from the world around it. It's only points of contact with the environment are via the inputs and the activities that the outputs uh, instruct. So uh, this didn't turn out too well, but Here's an algorithm that uh, some cognitive scientists have produced in order to explain how people are able to perform a simple recall task. Suppose I have a, a list of numbers here. I've asked you to memorize this list of numbers. And then the task for you as the subject is to tell me whether a particular number is among the list, the, the ones you've memorized. So the list might contain the numbers 28941. And then I expose you to the stimulus of four, 
and I ask you whether that's among the list of numbers you've memorized. And you can imagine that there are two different ways of solving this problem. One is that uh, you think of each number on the list you've memorized, and if you reach the number that I've asked you about, the number four, you simply stop and say, yes, it's on the list. Another kind of algorithm would have you compare the stimulus I'm asking you about four to every number on the list you've memorized, even numbers beyond the four on that list, and then give me, then give me your response. Um, and there's an algorithm, simply like a computer program, that cognitive scientists think is going on in your head in some way in order to produce this solution. Um, and the things to note about this approach to understanding a cognitive capacity like, like recall is that uh, it involves representations. You have a representation of the input. You have a representation of the numerals that you've memorized. And to perform the task, you're simply manipulating these symbolic representations in a way that gets you the right answer. That is a fairly, I think, paradigmatic kind of uh, approach to understanding a particular cognitive task. I want now to look at some ways of challenging this traditional computational approach to cognitive science. Uh, we'll see that Embodied cognition didn't come out of nowhere. It, in fact, has historical roots in the work of J.J. Uh, Gibson, who is a perceptual psychologist and the father of what is now known as ecological psychology. And embodied cognition is also indebted to some extent to uh, connectionist theories of mind. It also has roots in a phenomenological tradition, uh, Merleau-Ponty in particular, but I have um, no training in phenomenology, and I once tried to read some Merleau-Ponty and got in you know, a sentence or two and decided uh, it was impossible for me. So how might you challenge a computational approach to the mind? As Gibson thought about perception, he thought it was not a computational task. So here's how a, a classical cognitive scientist would understand perception. They would look at the information that's on the two-dimensional retina, and then they'd produce an algorithm that would, um, that would process the information on the two-dimensional retina in order to produce a three-dimensional perception. Okay? And some of the algorithms that uh, perceptual psych uh, computational perceptual psychologists produce We'll do things like extract information about the shape of objects from the kind of shading on the, on the retina, or extract information about depth from the disparity in the images of the two retinas. But Gibson thought perception isn't computational like that, and the reason is we have all the information necessary for perception in the environment. We don't need to add, embellish, or in any way amplify the sort of information that hits the retina, the information is already present in the environment. It's ours just for, for the picking up. So here's an example of the kind of thing that impressed Gibson. Imagine that on all the surfaces in the room around you were little light bulbs, okay? Now, if you walked toward a surface, oops, sorry. If you walk toward the surface, these little light bulbs would uh, leave, pat, leave lines of light as you're moving toward them. Or if you're moving away from a surface, the lines of light would be going in the opposite direction. It's like if you've ever watched uh, Star Trek and you see in the beginning there's this moving star field that makes you look as if you're moving toward these stars in the distance. Um, well, the, surface, the surfaces around us, reflect light, and they do so in such a way that when we move toward an object, the uh, light on the retina expands in a certain way, and as we move away from an object, the light moves away. And this is information that's present in the environment, and Gibson thought cues like this were 
all that the visual system needs to get around in the world. So we don't need to do computation. Another kind of example, um, imagine you see telephone poles and uh, you're wondering about the height of the telephone poles. How do you compute the height of an object? Well, according to computational psychologists, you need to know things like the distance from the viewer. And given the distance from the viewer, we're able to compute the height of the objects. We have the distance and we have their, their size on the retina, not sufficient for computing the height of the objects. But Gibson pointed out um, that, can you see that dark line? Gibson pointed out that if these telephone poles have the same proportion above and below this line, that's sufficient to tell you that they're all the same height, if they're cut by the horizon at the same proportions. And so by looking at the environment, the ecology of the organism, Gibson claims that uh, no computations are necessary for perception. The information's all out there, and we don't have to do anything fancy with it. Uh, I bring this up because it's a it's uh, it's been influential in the way people in embodied cognition think about about cognitive processes. People in embodied cognition tend to um, minimize the role of computation and the role of representation in their theory of mind. Yet another way to challenge computational psychology is um, by appeal to connectionist theories of mind. The connectionist thinks of um, mental processes as occurring in parallel. Uh, it involves simply the uh, representation of features at some input layer of units, and then these input layers are connected to a, hidden, a layer of hidden units and finally to a layer of output units. And there's massive connectivity between them. The nodes are all connected to each other. And the processing all happens in the way that the units are weighted in their connections to each other. The controversy is the extent to which these things are representational. Connectionists claim that there are representations in their nets. It just is the representations aren't uh, symbols the way they are in a, in a standard computational kind of description where you have input symbols and algorithms that operate on these symbols to produce other symbols. There is representation going on in here. It just is it's not of the standard computational form. And um, as we'll see, Embodied cognition theorists sometimes concede the presence of representations, but they want to describe the representations as more similar to the kind of representation that happens in a connectionist net than in a standard computer. Okay, I realize I've under-described what the connectionist is about, but my point uh, in the discussion from the last few minutes is just to present you with a sort of challenge distinct from the embodied cognition challenge that one might offer to standard computational psychology, but to present it to you because, uh, as I said, it's an inspiration for some of the work that I'm about to discuss now. So now let's uh, turn finally to embodied cognition. The, the research program embodied cognition is um, quite diverse. and to think of it as having a singular set of commitments, the way that standard computational psychology might be seen, I think is, is, is misguided. I think the diversity of research that falls under the umbrella term in body cognition is, is fairly vast. It bears some family resemblance to each other, but as, as far as the current state of the field goes, I like to think of embodied cognition research as divided into three main different branches. And so what I want to do uh, in the rest of this talk is describe three central areas of research in embodied cognition. And my claim is not that these bear no relationship to each other, but just that uh, they tend to cluster in these three different groups. 
and they might gain some support from each other in some ways, but for the most part, uh, it's convenient to think of the research in body cognition as belonging to one or the other of these three groups. So the three, the three areas of research um, that I've identified are first conceptualization, and this is the idea that our bodies somehow play a role in our ability to conceive of the world in certain ways, so that differently embodied organisms would have different conceptual repertoires for understanding the world. A second area of research is what I call replacement. People involved in replacement want to jettison, discard everything that the computational psychologists have told us about the mind and instead reconceive the mind in very different kinds of terms, terms that the computationalists could reject. The third, the third school of research that I focus on is what I call constitution and it's uh, the interest of those involved in constitution to show us how the world and the body are, in fact, constituents of mental processes. So if you think back to the uh, initial description of what a, a, compu a computational mind is and the kind of algorithm I showed you for, for uh, performing a task like recall, the body played no part in that algorithm. The world played no part in that algorithm. The mind was insulated from the body and the world. And in general, what we might say about embodied cognition, a theme that ties all the schools together, is that somehow bodies in the world enter the mind in a way that if you neglect to mention it, you fail to give an accurate characterization of mind. All right, with that by way of introduction, let me now turn to conceptualization, which is the first of the three groups of uh, research on embodied cognition I want to discuss. Here's a way to understand what proponents of conceptualization are up to, uh, and Sophia has heard bits of this from our media in Pittsburgh. We can think of an analogy uh, between uh, conceptualization and an area of research that has been fairly well explored already in linguistics and in philosophy, it's this analogy to linguistic determinism, where linguistic, determin linguistic determinism is the thesis that language determines how one conceives of the world. And by conceiving of the world, I mean something like this. We all have categories that we apply in order to parse the world, in order to carve the world at its joints. And some of us, in virtue of the categories we have, are able to make distinctions that others of us can't make because we lack those categories. So if you become um, proficient at tasting wine, you'll have categories like uh, Cabernet or Pinot or Merlot. And with these categories, you're now able to distinguish kinds of wine that someone without these categories is unable to distinguish. Now, uh, the great linguist Benjamin Worf claimed that language shapes the way we think and what we can think about. And what Worf meant was that in virtue of the language we speak, we will be able to recognize and classify things in the world in ways that we wouldn't if we spoke a different language or spoke no language at all. And, you know, the, 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 there's the mythic tale of the Eskimos who have, you know, 385 words for snow, and so they're able to distinguish kinds of snow that uh, the, the differences of which to which we're blind. That that research has been debunked, uh, by the way, but the idea is still there. There's a contemporary linguist, uh, Lyra Borditsky at, at Stanford, and she's done some interesting work. Uh, with languages that, uh, like Portuguese, that have uh, gendered, uh, gendered nouns, right? So those of us who speak English are, are lucky insofar as we don't have to remember whether a bridge is feminine or masculine. There's no reason for thinking it should be one way or the other. Uh, and um, my children who are learning Greek 
find it very frustrating that uh, a word for table should be masculine or feminine. I mean, there's nothing about a table that suggests it should go either way. Um, so what uh, Boroditsky did was she chose words that had different genders depending on the language. So in German, the word for bridge uh, has a feminine ending. In Spanish, it has a masculine ending. I don't know about Portuguese. I imagine it's like the Spanish, but bri bridge, is, bridge is feminine. OK, so uh, interesting. But it's masculine in Spanish. OK. <laughs> Why? Right? Okay. So, so what, what Boroditsky did was she had subjects simply describe for her uh, a bridge. And the German subjects would pick these adjectives that are stereotypically feminine. The bridge was beautiful, elegant, fragile, peaceful, pretty, and slender. Spaniards that the masculine ending would describe bridges as big, dangerous, long, strong, sturdy, and towering. Now the question is, why do Spaniards and Germans conceive of bridges in such different ways? And Boroditsky's suggestion is that the, the case ending makes a difference to how, how Germans and Spaniards think of bridges. And uh, she also, some of the other words she used, key is, uh, Key is feminine in Spanish and masculine in German, the word for key. And sure enough, the, uh, the Germans would describe a key as, as, as rigid, as sharp, as penetrating. And, uh, and the Spaniards would, would talk about its shininess and its, its uh, delicacy and, and things like that. Uh, now, just as the linguistic determinist thinks that the language we speak makes a difference to how we conceive the world. So some people in embodied cognition think that the bodies we have make a difference to how we categorize and understand the world. So here's the quotation from George Lakoff, a, a, a linguist, and Mark Johnson, a philosopher. They say the peculiar nature of our bodies shapes are very possibilities for conceptualization and categorization. So just substitute the peculiar nature of our bodies to the language we speak, and you get a claim very much like the claim that the linguistic determinants are making. Now, what evidence do they have for this claim? Um, they have a theory of uh, concept acquisition it's a very novel theory. Uh, the idea is that when we learn a concept that we were unfamiliar with, we learn it by metaphorical extension from concepts with which we're already familiar. So suppose you wanted to explain to a child what it means to be in a relationship with someone, and the child doesn't know what you're talking about. You can rely on concepts the child does understand and use them as metaphors in a way to extend their meaning of this concept they understand so that they can then appreciate what it means to be in a relationship with someone. So um, if you're trying to explain to your child what it's like to be in a relationship with someone, and you can say, it's kind of like a journey. There are bumps in the road sometimes that uh, you need to smooth out. And then there are long periods of just uh, going along smoothly. Uh, but every once in a while, you might get lost. Uh, and uh, you hope that the, the road doesn't, doesn't come to an abrupt end, you know, something like that. So by drawing on their knowledge of what a journey is, you're able to give them this new concept. Now, of course, you can't do that with every single concept. There has to be some basic level of concepts that you just simply understand. Otherwise, you'd have this kind of circularity problem. Now, where do these concepts that we just understand come from? 
Blakoff and Johnson think that they come from the constitution of our body. Because of the way we're built, we innately, inherently, simply understand some concepts. So how are we built? Well, we're oriented vertically. Our sensory organs are basically all in our front. So we have concepts like up and down as a result of our vertical orientation and front and back as a result of the placement of our sensory systems. So up and down, front and back, those will be basic concepts, and they help us to um, uh, serve as a kind of foundation from which to develop new concepts. Uh, here are some, some metaphors that they think are rooted in our basic concepts. Happiness in English, when you describe someone being happy, you could say they're feeling high or in high spirits or walking on air. Whereas if they're sad, they're feeling down, they're feeling low, they're downcast. And they think that um, this way of describing happiness and sad is rooted in our basic concepts of up and down. I imagine that in Portuguese there are similar kinds of uh, metaphors for describing happiness and sadness. And you know, the, the, they point to the fact that when you're happy, your, your chin is up and you're standing straight, and when you're sad, you're kind of slouchy and, and looking down. Um, so now we have our basic concepts, and they're tied to the kind of bodies we have. So it stands to reason, they say, that if you were a kind of spherical being living, out, living in a, in a gravitation-free environment, there'd be no up and down, no front and back, and so these beings wouldn't be able to understand concepts like up and down, front and back. And if they can't understand those basic concepts, then they can't understand all the concepts that derive from those basic concepts. And so were we to encounter one of these spherical beings, we would be unable to communicate with them. So different would our conceptual schemes be. Uh, here's a picture of a spherical being. It's actually a, a cold virus, but um, as good as I can get. Now, I think that Lakoff and Johnson uh, exaggerate the, the problem here. It seems to me that even if we lacked basic concepts that those with a different kind of body possess, that shouldn't prevent us from being able to conceptualize the world in the same way. Because um, there's nothing that seems to in, be entailed in their theory. Their, the theory doesn't seem to entail the impossibility of gaining same concepts via different routes. So suppose that although the spherical being didn't have as basic concepts, front and back, up and down, it was a very smart spherical being. Okay, so it was able to figure out Einstein's theory of relativity or something like that. Well, something that has the concepts for understanding relativity could presumably develop concepts like up and down, front and back, even if they're not derived from the shape of its body. So grant everything Lakoff and Johnson say as being correct, the concepts that we acquire, we acquire through metaphorical extension of other concepts, and these other concepts eventually bottom out in some level of basic concepts, and the basic concepts depend on the kinds of bodies we have. Grant all that, they haven't shown that we can't nonetheless acquire the same concepts just via different routes. Um, back to the analogy of linguistic determinism, even though uh, Spaniards and, and Germans speak different languages, we can imagine that uh, they're able to acquire the same concepts just through different means. And in fact, there's lots of research that shows that this happened. Um, some of this research uh, is by a man named Dan Slobin, a linguist named Dan Slobin. And what Slobin did was he, 
he showed pictures to Spaniards and to uh, Germans and to Israelis, and he had them describe these pictures. And the descriptions differed because the languages that the people used to describe the picture differed. Some of them lacked a uh, imperfect case. Uh, and so you might think they are seeing something different in these, in these identical pictures they're looking at. But what Sloven showed was that, no, in fact, they're not seeing the picture differently. It just is they're forced to focus on those elements of the picture that their language is best at expressing. Not that they couldn't see the other parts of the picture. And when asked to focus on these parts of the picture that their languages aren't adept at describing, they could describe them. It just is their descriptions were, were linguistically awkward, given the languages they had. Uh, and likewise, we don't have to think that um, the kinds of bodies we have limit or constrain the way we conceive the world. Rather, what we might think is that um, we tend to see the world in ways that uh, highlight the kinds of interactions with it someone with a body like ours can have. So let's think about someone who's learning a language like, like Spanish. And you're forced to memorize silly things like uh, bridges are, which ones were they? Masculine. Right now, how do you memorize that a bridge is masculine? One way of doing it is by, when you see a bridge, focusing on the attributes of the bridge that remind you of a man. It's strong and towering and sturdy. Well, now you have a way of remembering the next time you see a bridge that it's, it's masculine. It doesn't mean that the bridge looks different to you than it looks to a German. It's just as you're focusing on the aspects of the bridge that help you remember uh, it's masculine. Likewise, given that we have the bodies that we do, we'll tend to interact, we'll tend to conceive of objects in a way that make our interactions with them kind of apparent. So I might look at this table and see it as a nice place, nice surface on which to put things. My cat might look at this table and think of it as a nice place on which to sit. Uh, it's not that the table looks differently to us, it's just as we focus on different aspects of it, given the different uh, sorts of demands or affordances that our body permits. So I think this case for conceptualization is, is overstated. I want to look at some research now that also tries to tie our understanding of the world to the kinds of bodies that we have. This is research by a psychologist named Art Glenberg. And Glenberg claims that meaning is embodied. Or as he says here, it derives from the biomechanical nature of bodies and perceptual systems. So Glenberg thinks that we understand the meaning of sentences because of the bodies that we have. And it would be a corollary, once again, to say that if our bodies differed, we wouldn't be able to understand Now, how does he show this? The task of the subject has to do is a simple one. The subject simply has to say whether or not the given sentence is sensible. So, here's an example of a sentence that is just not oil in the air. And so the subject would push a button say, saying no to the question, is it sensible? The other sentences, and these are the ones that were really of interest to Glenberg, were um, toward sentences. A toward sentence would be something like, open the drawer or put your finger under your nose. These are toward sentences because the action that the sentence describes is one that would bring your hand toward you. 
opening the drawer or putting your finger under your nose. The away sentence would be close the drawer or put your finger under the faucet. Okay, so the subject is presented with sentences that are either toward, away, or nonsense. And the subject's task is simply to say sensible or not sensible. Now, how does the subject say this? Um, there are, there's a panel running away from the subject with five buttons. You press the center button, and that displays the, the stimulus. And then if it's sensible, you press the yes button at the top. If it's not sensible, you press the no button at the bottom. Now, in this condition, suppose that the subject is given an away sentence, close the drawer. And then the subject presses the yes button at the top. The subject's motion to press the button is the same motion suggested by the away sentence. But suppose the sentence is open the drawer, and the subject has to respond yes. Now the subject is forced to move away from him or herself to press the yes button, although the sentence is one that indicates the motion toward the subject. And what Glenberg found is that there's a kind of compatibility effect. Subjects were quicker to judge an away sentence sensible than a toward sentence. Is that clear? Okay. Now what does that show? Um, Lindbergh took it to show that our understanding of sentences is somehow uh, influenced by the kind of body we have. But some philosophers have criticized Glenberg for making a simple confusion, confusion that philosophers would think is pretty obvious, but psychologists, as much as I love them, um, aren't sensitive to. And the distinction that Adams points out is one between the meaning of a sentence and its sensibility. Remember, Glenberg has just asked subjects to judge whether a sentence is sensible or not. But that's very different from showing that the kind of bodies we have influences our understanding of the meaning of the sentence. So Glenn, uh, Adams' point is this. In both cases, whether the subject's asked to interpret the meaning of an away sentence or a toward sentence, the subject knows what the sentence means. Because the subject knows what the sentence means, that the subject then has some kind of conflict between an away response and a toward sentence, and the subject is facilitated with an away response given an away sentence. So there's nothing Glenberg has shown about whether the meaning, the understanding of the meaning, is dependent on the body. Glenberg has only shown that there's this difficulty in interpreting sentences uh, when the, the motion required to make a sensibility judgment differs from the motion implied by the sentence. And in fact, standard cognitive science has a ready explanation for this kind of effect. It's simply um, some sentences prime you to some motor actions and others inhibit some motor actions. It's, it's in essence uh, what psychologists call a, a Stroop effect. So uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Stroop effect, but imagine, imagine I had a list of words. They're all color words, blue, red, orange, green. And I ask you to uh, name the color that the color word is. And suppose that the word red is written in blue ink, and the word blue is written in red ink, and the word green is written in yellow ink. And I ask you to simply name the colors of these words. Well, if you see a, the word red written in blue ink, and I ask you to name what color it is, it's hard to do you're tempted to say red, it's as if your first inclination is to read and the second is to identify the color. It's just a kind of conflict. And likewise, 
if you read a sentence that suggests an away movement and you're asked to move your hand toward you, there's this kind of conflict. But there's nothing mysterious about this, or if there is, there's nothing more mysterious about this than there is about a whole raft of other kinds of psychological studies. So in the end, I think, Glenberg hasn't really shown us anything about the influence of body on meaning. He's just uncovered some interesting effects that standard cognitive science would not have a difficult time explaining in the first place. Um, so does conceptualization really challenge computationalism? Uh, why well, assume that computational processes can't underlie metaphorical understanding? Uh, it doesn't seem to me that Lakoff and Johnson have, have shown that they can't. And in fact, computer science or psychologists have, uh, in the not too distant past, developed lots of interesting algorithms that they claim help us understand metaphorical reasoning. If you saw the, uh, the competition between uh, the, the computer and the contestants on Jeopardy, a couple months ago there was a competition, Jeopardy game, pitting a computer against some, some human competitors, and many, many Jeopardy questions involved puns and metaphors and the computer beat the human contestants. Uh, and it wasn't that the computer was embodied that enabled it to do it. It wasn't embodied. Uh, it was just programmed in a way that allowed it to understand metaphor. So I don't think that um, metaphorical understanding by itself implies embodiment. And as we've already seen, Glenberg's results are consistent with standard findings in cognitive science, findings like, like the Stroop effect. Okay, so that was conceptualization. That was one staging area for the claims of embodied cognition. I want to look at another theme in embodied cognition now known as, as replacement. It's the, the idea uh, that old computational cognitive science needs to be thrown out. There's a paradigm shift to these people who uh, I've heard of Kuhn like to say. And in particular, what those involved in replacement think we should be replacing standard cognitive science with is something like um, a mathematical theory of behavior. It's in particular a dynamical systems theory explanation of behavior. That is a theory of behavior that understands behavior that, that uses differential equations for, for describing behavior. I'll um, try to clarify what this all means. Let's talk about the governing problem. Here's a problem. You have a steam engine, and you want it to run at a constant rate. If it goes too fast, you want it to slow down. If it goes too slow, you want it to speed up. How do you get this steam engine to run at a constant rate? Suppose you're a computational psychologist. You might write an algorithm. First step, measure the speed of the flywheel. This is what the steam engine controls. Second step, compare the actual speed of the flywheel against the desired speed. So you'll have a representation of the actual speed, a representation of the desired speed, and then you'll match them. If there's no discrepancy, you just go back to the first step and measure each. If there is a discrepancy, you take the difference between the actual speed and the desired speed, um, and you calculate how much additional steam pressure to add in order to increase the speed, or how much steam pressure to decrease it in order to make the speed slow down. And then you make the adjustment to the throttle valve accordingly so that you get either more or less steam pressure so that the actual speed matches the desired speed. So that's a, an algorithm that you might use to control the speed of the engine. Here's the way it's actually done. We have this uh, clever mechanism. This is called the, the Watt governor, although James Watt didn't invent it. He just uh, put his name on it. Um, but uh, 
here's the here's the throttle valve. And you can see that it's geared directly to the flywheel. This is the flywheel. This is spinning. Now, as this spins faster and faster, centrifugal force will carry these balls up. And as the balls lift, point F goes down, which raises H, which closes the throttle valve. And so the faster the engine goes, the more the throttle valve closes and the less steam escapes. Now, when it starts slowing down, the balls will drop, F will rise, H will lower, and the throttle valve will, will open, giving more steam. This is not a computational solution to the problem. There's no algorithm that this thing is, is using. There's no symbolic representations of actual speed and desired speed, and yet, it does a beautiful job maintaining the, the, the uh, speed of the flywheel. And in fact, we have a dynamical, or we have a differential equation. This describes the rate of change, of change of the flywheel ball. So this equation describes how the, the uh, height of the balls is changing uh, over time. Now, what if what if human behavior could be understood in the same sort of way as this centrifugal governor? That is, what if instead of thinking of human beings as performing algorithms on symbols, we think of them in the way that that governor works, and we just use differential equations to describe changes in their behavior. Uh, here's an experiment that uh, Scott Kelso has subjects perform. So the task is to simply uh, wiggle your fingers as fast as you can. Now, when you wiggle them like this, like windshield wipers on a car, that's called antiphase. And when they're wiggling like that, that's in phase. This is in phase because when wiggled like this, the same muscles are extending and flexing in each finger at the same time. Whereas here, when this muscle is uh, extending, this one's flexing or vice versa. Now, Kelso asked his subjects to increase the frequency of their, of their waggling. And what happens is if you start out of phase like this, you inevitably end up in phase. Whereas you start in phase, you stay in phase. Okay, so fascinating, right? Um, and there's this differential equation which predicts exactly when, well, it predicts a number of things. It predicts that as you speed the frequency out of phase, there will be uh, emergent erratic behavior until you fall into this new attractor and you're in the phase. So it makes that prediction. And Conclusion is, we don't, need com we don't need computers, we don't need algorithms, we don't need representations. We can understand behavior like this just by finding the right differential equations for describing it. And other psychologists jumped on the bandwagon. There's this interesting uh, effect known as the A not B error. error, error. Uh, babies of a certain age, something like seven months to 13 months, make an interesting kind of error. If you show them like two bright cups and you have a, a, a toy and you place it in one cup, the baby's watching. You, you place it in one cup and then you let them reach for the cup because they want the toy. And you do that over and over again. And then what you do is you take the shiny toy and you press, place it in the other cup. The baby reaches for the old cup. Um, and uh, Esther Thelen has something like 16 differential equations, which allow you to predict where the behavior, where the, where the baby will reach, taking as parameters things like the distance of the cups from the baby, the uh, brightness of the cups, uh, the, the weight of the baby's arm. And so we have another kind of description, and it's it's not cognitive insofar as 
felon's not interested in how the baby represents the situation, uh, not interested in providing an algorithm that would describe this kind of error. Another example of replacement uh, comes from robotics. Rodney Brooks, uh, in particular, a, a former roboticist at MIT, he's since made millions of dollars making his robots and so retired from MIT, um, describes robots that look something like this. This isn't actually one of his robots, but his robots look a lot like this. And these robots do some pretty amazing things. They're able to navigate through rooms. Uh, and cluttered rooms, rooms with obstacles, tables, chairs, rooms where people will all of a sudden walk in front of the robot. And the robot is able to make a course through the room, avoiding all these obstacles. And some of the robots are able to do things like locate things you've asked it to locate. Some can pick up empty cans of Coke to recycle them, bring them to a recycling bin. And if you're a, a standard cognitive scientist, you're, you're first thought is, wow, there must be some pretty incredible algorithms in this thing. It must have something like a mental map of its environment. And it must at all times be consulting this map in order to figure out where it is and calculate its course to know where it needs to go. That seems to be the way that a, a traditional cognitive scientist would think about how to build one of these things. But that's not how Brooks built this thing. Instead, its architecture is extremely simple. It has some sensors on the periphery around it. And all these sensors do is give a signal when there's a, a certain distance from a wall. So imagine it's six inches from a wall. It's getting a signal from its sensors, from its lateral sensors. If it moves too far from the wall, it will no longer receive a message from the sensor. If it moves too close to the wall, it might be programmed so that it simply stops or veers to the left. So it, its sensor is connected directly to the, the, the motor that drives the wheels. So long as it's receiving a signal of a certain strength, it'll follow the wall. And in this way, it'll get around the room. And it might have a sensor in its front. <clears throat> the only purpose of this sensor is to stop the robot if it's getting a reading. This means you know, this will prevent it from running into something. And when stopped, it might have a mechanism that simply turns it to the left. In this way, it's able to avoid things. So think of these robots not as programmed with anything very sophisticated. Rather, they're just a bundle of reflexes that are tied together. And when you tie together all these reflexes, you get emerging from the mess something that seems very versatile and on first examination would make you think it's really smart. It's got some sophisticated programs. But it doesn't. And Brooks's bet is that human beings are like these robots. Rather than having uh, algorithmic processes with representations, we're just a messy bundle of reflexes that, when put together, in ways that can inhibit each other, we appear pretty smart. So both Brooks's work and the work of the dynamical system theorists like Kelso are offered as replacements for standard cognitive science. This is the way we should be doing cognitive science, they think. But there are some problems with that. Let's first look more carefully at what it is that they're actually claiming. I call this the, the argument for representational skepticism. The idea is this. Representations are supposed to be stand-ins for actual objects, right? So um, the reason why we might, when thinking about a badger, when no badger, you know, suppose we want to think about a badger, but there's no badger present in front of us. Well, that's why we need a representation. We can use the word badger to stand in for the real thing, or we can use the thought badger to stand in for the real thing. So it's convenient to have a representation when you don't have a badger and you want to think about badgers. So representations are stand-ins. But 
an agent in a dynamical system is in continuous contact with the objects with which it needs to interact. So think again about the centrifugal governor. Um, the speed, the flywheel is connected direct, directly to the fly balls, which is connected directly to the uh, throttle valve. These things are in continuous contact, so they don't need to represent what's happening with each. Or the robot is in continuous contact with its environment, it doesn't need a map of the room in order to figure out where to go because it's able to use the world, as Brooks says, as its own representation. The world's there, so it doesn't need a stand-in for it. If there was a badger in front of me, I could just point to it and you'd know what I'm talking about. I wouldn't need to use a word or to use a thought in order to convey the presence of the badger. So an agent in a dynamical system is in continuous contact with the objects with which it needs to interact. And if in continuous contact with the objects with which it needs to interact, it doesn't need the stand-ins for it. And so an agent in a dynamical system has no need for representations. That's the idea that these people in replacement are pushing. Uh, but there's some problems with this. First, Continuous contact doesn't eliminate the need for representational states. It's clearly not sufficient, right? Um, so this water bottle is in continuous contact with the table, but I don't think that this water bottle represents the table. This doesn't have that ability. What we want to know is why is it sometimes continuous contact leads to behavior that's responsive in a certain kind of way, and other times not. And simply to point out that you have continuous contact doesn't, doesn't suffice to say in what cases representations are necessary or not. But it's also true that continuous contact um, uh, isn't necessary for representation. Right? That, that should be pretty obvious. So, Andy Clark talks about these representation-hungry problems. So when is a problem representation-hungry? That is, when is a problem the kind of problem that really requires the use of a representation? And one such uh, example would be when entertaining counterfactual states of affairs. I want to know what would have happened if Sophia had to me up at the airport yesterday. Okay, well, she did. Uh, so I, no worries there, but to think about what I would have done had she not met me requires me to think about things that I'm certainly not in continuous contact with because they're counterfactual. They never happened. What would I have done? I would have called a cab. I would have sat in a corner and trembled and cried. I don't know what I would have done. Um, so those seem to be representation-hungry problems, problems reasoning about absent, non-existent things. But also, um, organisms are sensitive to, uh, or organisms need to do a kind of abstraction often, where this abstraction takes us toward properties that uh, aren't nomological in any sense. So we all have the category dangerous. and this category applies to lots of different things. So what are dangerous? Well, guns are dangerous, snakes are dangerous, cliffs are dangerous, uh, rabid dogs are dangerous. But what do all these things have in common, despite the fact that they're dangerous? Well, they don't really have anything in common, and that's why the category danger is an abstract category. It abstracts from all these different things and gives me a single label to describe them to. And it seems like that's another area in which we need representations. Simple contact with these organisms. There's no, there's no danger property that I can be in contact with when in contact with each of these organisms. And still another problem, well, that didn't turn out well at all, is that um, finger wagging. That's not really a very cognitive task. Uh, 
Lots of times these people uh, involved in replacement are focused on kinds of behavior that the cognitive psychologist would look at and think, who cares about that anyway? But that's not what I'm doing. I'm studying things like attention and recall and language acquisition and, uh, and categorization. And you're studying finger wagging. Well, have fun, but that's not, that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the mental processes that produce behavior. I'm not interested in the behavior itself. And I think that um, much of the work coming out of the replacement program in embodied cognition has simply adopted a different subject matter. They can exist side by side with cognitive psychologists they're not challenging cognitive psychologists because, in fact, they're trying to explain something else. How am I doing on time? I think I'm doing OK, right? Yeah. OK, great. OK, final, final area uh, that I want to discuss today. Constitution, this is the area that has certainly attracted most philosophical interest. And I think it's because um, most of the most of the work done in Constitution is, is of a more conceptual nature um, insofar as it's trying to articulate what minds really are. And it's not as constrained or informed by the kind of empirical research that uh, those involved in conceptualization or those involved in replacement are, are engaged with. The idea behind constitution is that traditional theories of mind have not recognized the significance of the body or the world. And um, the significance of these things lies in the fact that they're actually parts of the mind. They're constituents of the mind. And I want to be clear that there's this difference between constituent and cause. Okay, so I'm thinking of constituents as parts of a whole. The retina is a constituent of the eye or the Battle of Gallipoli is a constituent of World War I. The eye would be a different kind of thing if it lacked a retina, and World War I would have been a different kind of thing if it, if it lacked the Battle of Gallipoli. So constituents are somehow important. I don't want to use the word essential, since we all know there's no analytic synthetic distinction anymore, but if there were, I'd be saying essential parts of, of these things. Causal influences, causes are distinct from their effects. They can be separated from their effects. Uh, so the, uh, the Archduke's assassination was a cause of World War I, but it's distinct from World War I. And in fact, we might think World War I could have been caused by something else. And uh, when, you, when you move your head around, you're putting different images on your retina. And that's a causal influence of, of the images on your retina. Okay? The images are as they are because of the way you move your head. Okay, so you know, if, to give a full treatment of the difference between constituent and cause would be well beyond the, the scope of this talk. There's a lot of metaphysics that goes into trying to make this distinction fast. But I'm trusting that what I'm saying here is kind of rough and ready enough to make the points that follow. Now, some people like Alvin Noe um, have claimed that perception is in part an exercise of a certain kind of our bodies. And so they think of the bodies and our actions as actually a constituent of perception. So if you want to know where perception takes place, the standard theory, the theory that you see growing out of computational theories of perception, 
perception takes place in the brain. And, you know, visual perception takes place back here in the visual cortex. But according to uh, sensory motor theories of perception, perception actually extends into the environment and into the body. And so the, if you wanted to draw a circle around the perceiving organ, you wouldn't draw a circle just around the brain, you draw it around the whole organism. Uh, so here's Alvin Noe, who is uh, famous for saying lots of crazy things. Um, he says, our ability to perceive not only depends on, okay, that would be the causal influence claim, but is con constituted by our possession of a sort of sensory motor knowledge. So let me say what sensory motor knowledge is. Um, sensory motor knowledge is so-called, it's got a sensory portion, knowledge of how perception depends on unique features of a sensory system. For example, a curved retina. And a motor portion, knowledge of how perception depends on motor activities, like eye movements, head movements, etc. Now, the word knowledge here shouldn't be uh, inflated beyond what Noe actually needs. He doesn't think that uh, the knowledge is somehow represented by the subject or can actually be uh, articulated by the subject. The knowledge is a kind of tacit knowledge. It's kind of a know-how. It's like um, you have a knowledge how to ride a bicycle, even if you could never explain how you can ride a bicycle, even if you don't have propositional knowledge of how to ride a bicycle, you still have the skill. So you can think of sensory motor knowledge as a kind of skill. And of course, since sensory motor knowledge depends on the unique features of our sensory system, um, and the unique uh, attributes of our body, I would also think that this kind of view is consistent with what I was really earlier called conceptualization. And in fact, Alvin Noe has said things like, uh, in order to perceive the world, an organism needs to have the same kind of sensory motor. In order to perceive the world as a human being does, an organism needs the same kind of sensory motor uh, knowledge that a human being does. Here's an example of sensory motor knowledge at work. If, um, this is from Alba's book, if you're staring at a line on a piece of paper, uh, and then you raise your vision to a point above that line, this line, which was originally uh, a, straight, uh, a straight line on the back of the retina, now becomes an arc as uh, it's higher up on the retina. So this is how the line is originally shaped on the retina, and this is what happens to the line when you change your point of focus from the line straight ahead to a point above the line. Now, this fact that a uh, line will project differently on the retina, it's a fact about, it's contingent on the nature of our sensory system. It's because our retinas are, are concave. You can imagine organisms with different kinds of eyes would have retinas that didn't project the lines in those different shapes. And it's also a result of the way we move our eyes. So that's the motor portion. So Alva's theory is that the world looks as it does because of the unique properties of our sensory motor systems. It does unique things. It shapes, shapes the stimuli with which we're, with which we're faced in unique sorts of ways. But um, as, as people, especially Ken Aizawa, have pointed out, perception doesn't appear to require exercise of sensory motor capacity. So Noe actually thinks it's a constituent of our perceptual experience uh, or that, that our, our body and our sensory systems are constituents of that experience. And yet, we have people who are paralyzed so that they're not exercising their sensory motor systems the way that non-paralyzed people do, and yet they're able to perceive. Um, there are stories of uh, 
Well, this is fairly well known that um, in the early days before anesthesia uh, was used regularly, people facing a kind of surgical procedure were injected with a paralytic, like Harari, and then with a, uh, a uh, amnesic. And so although they felt pain during the procedure, the amnesic would then cause them to forget the pain that they felt. Um, I still wonder whether this is going on or not. Um, but people would sometimes, you know, people would report, if the amnesia wasn't sufficient, they would report terrible pain during the surgical procedure. And this is inconsistent with Noah's view because they were completely paralyzed, uh, unable to, to, to engage their sensory motor systems. So that seems like an empirical disconfirmation of Noe's claim. Um, also, it seems that Noe falls prey to the uh, a failure to distinguish causes from constituents. Why not just think that it's, it's in virtue of the way our sensory motor systems work that we have the experiences that we do? Why think of their operations as constituents of the experience rather than simply as causal influences on that experience? Extended cognition is, um, I think, probably the philosophically most uh, recognized form of constitution, uh, in large part due to the work of uh, David Chalmers and Andy Clark, especially Andy Clark. And the idea behind the extended cognition is that our cognition actually extends into, into the world, into our bodies. And so when we talk about where cognition happens, the brain is the wrong place to point, although the brain is certainly a central component in cognition. But cognition can be happening in lots of places. So um, one reason to think of, con uh, of cognition as extending is in virtue of this kind of coupling relation that Andy Clark likes to talk about. So I'll read this quote to you. Andy Clark says, um, he describes cases where, quote, we confront a recognizably cognitive process running in some agent that creates outputs, speech, gesture, expressive movements, written words, that recycled as inputs drive the cognitive process along. In such cases, any intuitive ban on counting inputs as parts of mechanisms seems wrong. Um, so imagine you're writing a paper and what you do is you have some thoughts, and you type them out on the paper, and then you look at the what you've written, and this creates some new thoughts, which you then put on the paper, which creates still further new thoughts, and you have this kind of looping cycle going. And what Andy wants to claim is that the idea that it's only when the stuff is in your head that they count as thoughts seems artificial. Why do we say once they're in the head, they're thoughts, but once they're on the paper, they're not thoughts? Um, and he's got this analogy to something like a, a turbocharged engine, where a turbocharged engine actually uses the exhaust it produces and feeds it back into the engine in order to make the turbines turn faster which creates more exhaust, which then gets fed into the engine. And, and where is the engine here? Or what, is, what are the parts of the engine system? It seems like you'd have to include the exhaust, which is an output, as a component in the engine itself. And likewise, we should think of, of the mind as extending beyond simply what's going on in the brain to the things in the paper as well. Uh, but uh, Clark and, uh, sorry, uh, Adams and Aizawa, who are you know, the two most outspoken critics of extended cognition, say that Clark is committing what they call the, the coupling constitution fallacy. So this fallacy is something like this. The pattern of reasoning here involves moving from the observation that process X 
is in some way causally connected to a process Y of type P, then the conclusion that X is part of a process of type P. So they ask this question, why did the pencil think that 2 plus 2 equals 4? And Clark's answer is because it was coupled to the mathematician. Right? So um, clearly an embarrassment for Clark if pencils end up thinking because they are coupled to mathematicians. But I don't think Clark is making that mistake. Um, so he's, he's not committed to the claim that cognition is happening in the pencil, or that cognition is happening on the paper that you're using or the computer you're using to help yourself write an article. Um, he's just claiming that these things can be constituents of the cognitive process, not that the cognitive process has to happen in those constituents. And uh, when I put this point to, to Adams and Aizawa, they pull out passages where it seems like Clark really is saying that he thinks of the process as happening out there. And I pull out passages where it seems he's saying it's just constituent of a process that's out there. And then we buy a bunch of beers and laugh about it. Um, but I think, you know, to be charitable to Clark, what he's really focused on is the idea that the constituents of cognition can belong to the world as well as to things going on in the head. And he's not, he's not making this stronger and, uh, to my ear, absurd claim that cognitive processes are actually happening independently of the brain. Um, the parity argument for extended cognition is probably the most famous. This is an argument that Clark and Chalmers introduced for their discussion of these two people, Otto and Inga. So Otto and Inga live in New York City. They both read about a, an exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art. They both decide it looks like a good exhibit to see. So Inga consults her memory to remember that the Museum of Modern Art is on 53rd Street, and she jumps in a subway and goes to 53rd Street. Otto, though, has Alzheimer's disease, and he doesn't remember where MoMA is. And so he opens up a diary that he keeps on hand at all times. And he reads the Museum of Modern Art is on 53rd Street. So he hops on the train and goes to 53rd Street. And then Clark and Chalmers invoke this parity principle. If, as we confront some task, a part of the world functions as a process which were it done in the head, we'd have no hesitation in recognizing as part of the cognitive process, then that part of the world is, so we claim, part of the cognitive process. The idea being that the entries in Otto's notebook are parts of a cognitive process no less than Inga's memories in her brain. The fact that Inga stores her memories in her brain and Otto stores his memories on a notebook is supposed to be a difference that makes no difference as far as understanding their behavior goes. Um, Adams and Aizawa say this is all wrong. In assessing whether something outside the brain is cognitive, it must be measured against what they call marks of the cognitive, necessary conditions for being cognitive. And the notebook doesn't meet these conditions. So Adams and Aizawa say if something's really to be cognitive, it has to, for instance, have original intentionality. So what has original intentionality? Thoughts have original intentionality because there's no one assigning to your thought of um, of water the content water. Your thought about water just means water. Whereas the word W-A-T-E-R, that means water because of some convention. We English speakers have decided that we'll use those letters to stand for water. So that's, that's uh, derived intentionality. It means what it does on the basis of other people 
meaning what they do. But our thoughts don't mean what they do in virtue of others assigning meaning to them. The entries on the notebook mean what they do because of these conventions that say that sentence means MoMA's on 53rd Street. But Inga's thought that MoMA's on 53rd Street just means what it does for, now you pick your favorite theory of content and say that's why it means what it does. Uh, but when we look at the parity argument again, uh, it's not clear that Clark and Chalmers are making this mistake. They say, if as we confront some task, a part of the world functions as a process which were done in the head, we'd have no hesitation in recognizing as part of the cognitive process, then it counts as that. So it's as if they're starting already with a stipulation that what's going on in the world is something we would say is cognitive if it were going on in the head. So here's um, my parody on, uh, on Adams and Aizawa. Suppose we had a principal fish parody. And we had no definition of what a fish is. But still, if a part of the world functions as an organism, which were in an aquarium, we'd have no hesitation in recognizing as a fish, then that part of the world is a fish. Seems like a perfectly good way of picking out fish, even if we don't have some marks of fishhood the way that Adams and Aizawa claim we need marks of the mental in order to, to describe something as, as cognitive. The point is that we've already assumed that we know a fish when we see one. And I think Clark and Chalmers have simply assumed that we'll know a cognitive task when we see one. If you're not sure whether what Otto is doing is cognitive, pick some other task that you're sure is cognitive and describe a situation in which what's ordinarily done in the brain is now done in the world, and we have their conclusion. Um, but is extended cognition a challenge to computational cognitive science? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think it's a challenge because you can still make sense of this talk of representations and algorithms and computational processes, which are all the hallmark of cognitive science, and simply think of the kinds of things involved in these algorithms as including things in the environment. So as Rob Wilson has made the point, computationalism is neutral with respect to where the objects of computation exist. We typically think of them existing in the head, but that's not an essential feature of computationalism. They could exist as well in the world around us. OK, we get to the final score then. Uh, this is my assessment of the uh, nature of the challenge that embodied cognition is, is presenting to cognitive science. I think that. Um, Conceptualization fails to show that meaning is embodied and offers data that can be explained by traditional methods. This was my discussion of, of Glenn Berg and of Lakoff and Johnson. Replacement, I think, provides some new techniques for understanding cognition and offers some new insights into some cognitive phenomena, but it will not replace all cognitive science. In particular, it's not going to uh, help us understand these representation-hungry problems, these problems in which we are reasoning about counterfactual situations or depending upon abstractions in the way we do when we identify things as, as dangerous. Um, but I think the dynamical systems framework that uh, some, some cognitive scientists are now developing in certain ways will, will add to our understanding of certain cognitive uh, phenomena. And finally, constitution, I think, should not be construed as competing with traditional cognitive science. It simply invites us to consider a broader conception of what computation is. OK, that's, that's Bucky the Badger. That's our university mascot. Um, 
Thanks a lot for listening. Yes. So thanks a lot, uh, Larry. And, and so we we have two choices now. We could uh, uh, start now the discussion, or or we could drink some coffee and some uh, cookies, I, uh, and then come back. So maybe coffee. And a little uh, break, yes? Okay. And we take a break. Thank you very much. Okay. So uh, let's continue uh, now with our debate and about uh, embodied cognition. And I will just mediate uh, the discussion, yes? And Okay, so I open into questions, and who who wants to ask Larry um, can start now. Okay. Hi, um, Larry. I'm really interested in questions about uh, beliefs intentions, desires, and um, as you pointed out, they're, they're, uh, uh, they've been studied in a computational theory, right? Um, so I guess my question is how much of your, of what you propose um, is different to um, functional descriptions of how the mind works? I'm, I'm especially thinking of what we understand as beliefs, Intentions, desires that are normally suited as representational. So, I think that a lot of what I said could be made consistent with functional analyses of beliefs and desires. So, um, certainly, if you think of beliefs and desires as functional states, there's no reason why you couldn't. Um, accept some of the claims of extended cognition. Uh, according to the, the functionalist, uh, mental states are, are realization neutral, right? They could be realized in all sorts of different kinds of, of hardware. And so it's, it's consistent with extended cognition that some of the realization base of beliefs and desires construed functionally exist outside the brain. So. I don't see that as in any way inimical to functionalism. I think where um, where the functionalist might have a greater difficulty accepting the claims of embodied cognition would be in the um, area of conceptualization, because uh, conceptualization denies the kind of neutrality that that functionalists are committed to. So if it turns out that our body is constrained the kinds of uh, mental states we can have, then that would come as bad news to the functionalist. No, I, I guess that I, I'm not um, a fan of functional uh, descriptions of the mind. Mm -hmm. I, in fact, I, I, I think um, it, it seems to me that some mental states really need a representational description. Uh, so so that, that's, my, that's my question, because I, 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 I heard your presentation as leaning towards the functional uh, understanding of the mind, and, and uh, it seems that some, some states, such as, as I said, beliefs and intentions, desires, they, they seem to, although they have uh, bodily um, reactions, you, you use your body in certain ways, uh, but it seems that you could not and still hold a belief, an intention. You could do nothing. You could not move your body, not do anything. Yes, right. How, how then are we to understand those? I mean, if, if we are thinking in, in this framework of embodied cognition. Um, 
So I, I think you'd have to think about which commitments of embodied cognition you're actually interested in. So those involved in, in replacement, of course, deny the need for representations. And so they would reject the kind of analysis of belief and desire that you're suggesting, which seems to me uh, almost by definition, beliefs and desires have to be representational. Beliefs are states about things, and desires are desires for things, and what they're about or what they're for um, are represented in, in, the, in the belief or desire state. So I, I think of those as, as almost insuperable obstacles to someone who wants to deny representational capacities of the mind. Now, I'm not sure whether I'm a dyed-in-the-wool functionalist. Uh, I've been skeptical about functionalism since starting to think about uh, multiple realization, which, which is a central tenet of functionalism. Uh, and I'm not sure that uh, the kinds of multi claims for multiple realization and the way that those claims are, are uh, built into an argument for functionalism really succeed. So I, I'm a, I share your doubts about functionalism, I think. I would like to ask you something now. So um, I have this uh, very general question. Um, to start with, because uh, all this approach uh, from embodied cognition, uh, do you think maybe the computational theorist could could say, okay, um, we have a body, we move, we act on the world, but couldn't we reproduce this or um, do something similar that with algorithms, couldn't we uh, translate all these movements, all these actions in algorithms uh, so that we, had, we would have inputs and uh, so it's the, the old Cartesian challenge, okay, we have all this stimulus and all this, but um, what is new in this approach, in this sense, uh, how would they answer to this old-fashioned philosophical questions about uh, the possibility that we just are brains that uh, are receiving inputs and that don't know really or don't know in a philosophical way that if our body is real, okay? I don't know if it's clear, but... No, it's very clear. Yeah. Um, here, here's a way to, to put your question, and one that I think might help produce an answer. You can think of um, the brain as screening off everything else, right? So we have this world around us. And the world around us is producing all sorts of energies that our sensory systems are capable of detecting. And now we can say, forget about the world around us because once the energy hits our sensory systems and is transduced into a form that our brain can, can manipulate, it's as if the world doesn't exist. And in fact, you know, if we had a computer that was able to stimulate our sensory systems in the same way the world is, we'd have identical mental states, right? That's the kind of brain in the bat scenario. So one way of interpreting your question is, given that the operations of the brain screen off everything else, why think that the body and the, and the world are important? Um, and one way to, to answer that question is, to put the burden on that sort of position to say why it is that it's, it's the brain that should be the object of focus. So imagine that within the brain, when you're thinking about uh, your mother, there are 
a million neurons involved in thinking about your mother. So now we can say that the brain doesn't really matter. We have these million neurons that screen off all the other operations of the brain. And in fact, we can talk about one neuron that only really matters, and there's 999,999 around it that contribute to the state of this one neuron. So your argument, um, if we follow it to its extreme, we could take to show that it's not the brain that does cognition, it's a, it's a single neuron. And um, what people like Andy Clark will say is that in focusing on the brain as the center of cognition and saying that all the other stuff outside the brain, the world and the body, is screened off or irrelevant, you're making a kind of artificial stipulation. Um, and it's the same kind of stipulation that seems objectionable, but that could lead you to think it's just one neuron in the brain that's doing all the work. So you have to decide, I think, um, you have to appeal to empirical sciences to find out what they need to understand in order to understand cognition. Uh, and what people in embodied cognition are banking on is that the smallest unit of study for understanding cognition has to expand beyond the brain and talk about the world and the, and the, and the body as well. Thank you, Larry, for your talk. And uh, it's a kind of new field for me, uh, the embodied cognition. But the idea, the whole idea is not new for me, and I'm very fond of it. So I, I would like to push you to the other side. Too. And it seems to me that at least at the end, it was for me clear that you are not, as you answer to Guillermo, you have doubts. I would like to, to push you to, to more to functionality and things like that. And I'm asking you, why do you have doubts? What's, what is the problem? Your answer is kind of it surprises me to hear from you that beliefs can only be explained explained in terms of representations. And I can think in lots of examples where you see people believe in some things without representing anything. When people reach a, a cup of glass and, and drink the water, of course, I believe there is water there and things like that. Things which is much more emotional than the uh, linguistic analysis of believing in a, in, in a proposition would imply to. So, that's kind of thing I, I could uh, add to your explanation. So, um, but my point is, why do you have doubts? What is the problems you see in this, in this, in this changing of perspective uh, from a very traditional and very important, very dominant view uh, uh, from our mind and philosophical view, dominant view in philosophy as well, how we, we understand we, we should handle philosophical problems to this uh, more embodied, more connected with the world uh, perspective. So why, what's the doubts you have and what you think is the, the direction to solve that? Mm -hmm. um, I actually came to study embodied cognition uh, very sympathetic to it because of a, of a background in, in Gibsonian psychology. Uh, I, I, I come from a, a lineage of people who were very uh, taken with ecological psychology, Gibson School of Psychology. And um, in, the, in the 80s, Gibsonian psychology was under uh, tremendous uh, pressure from people like Jerry Fodor and Zenon Pilishin uh, and others in the computational movement. And I found myself defending Gibsonian psychology against these computationalists. And uh, so, so in a way, my, my skepticism toward embodied cognition is it's, it's a sort of mild sort of skepticism. I, I'm not rejecting 
the, the ideas, uh, because of hardcore commitments to computationalism, I'm, a, I'm in fact very sympathetic to the, the Gibson-style psychology from which, from which embodied cognition emerges. But what I, what I do find objectionable are um, claims that I think reveal kinds of conceptual confusions or, or claims that, that reach far further than the data should allow. Uh, so I, I gave some examples of, of both kinds of things, I think. I think Alvin Noe's claim that in order to perceive, you have to be able to, to move is just, it's, it's wrong. I mean, it's empirically verifiably wrong. And, and Glenberg's claim that we can't judge as, that we derive the meanings of, of sentences from operations of our body also seems to be better, his findings seem to be better accounted for by, by other means. So I, I'll, I'll be skeptical of claims in embodied cognition that the empirical research simply don't bear out. Now that said, I think that what's important about embodied cognition is that it's bringing to focus all sorts of ways that the body is an integral element in cognition that, um, that people who have adopted the kind of view that Sophia was expressing have, have denied for a long time. So I think it's very interesting that um, when people approach a staircase or when people approach a doorway, they tend to judge whether the staircase is climbable or whether the doorway is passable through on the basis of the size of their body. Uh, this is work that's been demonstrated in, in Warren's lab at, at Brown University. And what's interesting now is that the body information about the body has become sort of a part of the algorithm that these people use to make judgments about, say, whether a staircase is climbable or whether a door is pass passable through. And this kind of work was neglected by traditional cognitive scientists who thought that uh, it's just the algorithms in the brain that we need to pay attention to. And the kinds of problems, the kinds of problems that cognitive scientists should focus on would be things like how to play chess, how to parse a sentence, how to solve the Tower of Hanoi puzzle. And these problems never lent themselves to consideration of the body because you don't need the body for doing that. But it turns out that most of cognition does have to attend to features of our body. One of the things the mind does is control the body. And that, uh, that point is what I think is very valuable about embodied cognition, and it's requiring that traditional computationalists um, think about what the mind's doing in a new sort of way. So I'm on board with all of that. Uh, it's claims that reveal conceptual confusion or are unsupported by the data that, that I'm going to resist. people are, are, are thinking. So uh, uh, this new approach, um, <clears throat> you mentioned an uh, experiment that we read also in your book uh, that um, was done first uh, by Piaget, this experiment with the child and the cover and so on. And um, this uh, this was Glenda, no. This was uh, Thelen, Esther Thelen. And uh, Esther Smith. Thelen. So, so uh, Esther Thelen, uh, she, her conclusions are that we don't need uh, any kind of notion of representation so as to uh, to explain what, why the child reach uh, one cup and not the other one, and so on. Uh, 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 do you see? So it's not your uh, conclusion, is it? Uh, so we we 
we need not just a notion of representation, but we need to suppose existence of representations. Is there a difference between uh, supposing that we represent factually and uh, the other kind of methodological approach uh, of representation that we need the notion, philosophical the notion of representation? I have this doubt if there is a difference between these two kind of things. The factuality of representation and the use, the methodological use of representation. Yeah. I think um, I'm a Quinean when it comes to scientific posits. So I, I think that um, the best argument for the existence of representations is that our theory needs them to explain. Uh, someone like Daniel Dennett appears more like an instrumentalist. He'll say that we 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 talk about representation is the way we talk about centers of gravity. An object, there's no molecule in an object that, it's a, that is its center of gravity, such that if you remove that molecule, it would no longer have a center of gravity. Center of gravity is a, it's a purely theoretical entity that we use to explain the behavior, and we can be a non-realist about centers of gravity. Whereas another view is, no, it really does have a center of gravity. Um, that doesn't mean that there's a molecule that is identical with it, but it really has one. And the, the, the best reason for saying it really has one is because in assuming its existence, we're now able to explain why it tips over at a certain point. Uh, so that's how I think about representations. If, if we need them to understand cognition, then they exist just as electrons exist, because we need them to understand the behavior of, of atoms. OK. Uh, well, possibly I have two, two different questions or two different comments. Uh, the first is uh, uh, I want to uh, I, I said uh, before to, to our students and to our colleagues and to you uh, uh, that uh, uh, embodied cognition, the book, your book, was for me uh, very difficult to capture uh, because it, it and your presentation uh, uh, well uh, it cleared some things up uh, and I can. I could, I can understand uh, some uh, things uh, better, uh, but the problem is that we philosophers, and, I, and here I'm presenting me as a philosopher, not as, as a physician, because even if I am a physician, I don't understand psychology well, and uh, psychology is a, an enterprise that has uh, a lot of subtleties and, and methodological uh, particularities, and so for us to understand and to uh, get inside the, 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 the issue, the, the, uh, it's not easy. And so uh, my first difficult to understand is to uh, to capture some concepts. And uh, but you, your uh, book uh, tried to make a synthesis and present three different great concepts uh, that possibly uh, uh, clear the different styles or different uh, lines of research. And so uh, it, it is conceptualization replacing, replacement and constitution. And if I understood your suggestion <laughs> in, your, in the finish, uh, in the end of your book, you said, however, if I am right that conceptualization, replacement, and constitution define categories uh, into which most work in embodied cognition might be sorted, then a detailed discussion of each should uh, take us a long way toward uh, understanding what embodied cognition is and to what extent it stands as a genuine alternative to standard cognitive science. And you, your final 
sentences time to begin. And so my, my question is, uh, uh, we philosophers, what we uh, we can do with this, uh, uh, because uh, we need to uh, get inside deeper in psychology, uh, in an interdisciplinary uh, uh, cooperation, uh, or uh, try to do as you did, uh, read. Uh, them, them and try to understand what they are saying and, and after uh, present, oh, you have these difficulties and they will see us as, as like those boring philosophers that try to make difficulties and uh, uh, my, 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 my question is uh, how we can uh, design or, uh, or plan <laughs> Or study, uh, uh, because uh, the the conclusion you presented to us is that uh, they have some conceptual um, uh, uh, unclarities, or uh, uh, they and and, and scientists uh, usually uh, try to uh, create different fields of and and, and uh, uh, possibly uh, embodied cognition will uh, will run in a different course uh, cons comparing to cognitive sciences. And so what we do in this, uh, uh, in this situation, uh, because we, we, uh, we, 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 we use the shirt of one uh, conception and try to fight with, with them against the others or, or, or stay in our position and try to uh, put them in conflict and, 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 and find their inconsistencies, etc. What we, what you're suggesting, what we, we have to do? One um, characterization of philosophy that I, that I don't like is that it's the handmaiden of the sciences, as if it's our job to sit back and pronounce on the practices of scientists and tell them what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong. I mean, they resent that and they're right to resent that. Uh, my, my own approach uh, is to engage with psychologists who are, who are working on these issues. I'm, I'm fortunate that I'm in a, in a, university with a psychologist who, who has some interest in these areas and I can talk with them and I'm in correspondence with people like Art Glenberg and uh, Art will send me some research he's doing and I'll ask him some questions that often enough lead him to try to clarify what he's thinking about. Uh, sometimes he tells me I just don't understand Sometimes I tell him he just doesn't understand, but but more often, more more often we we're able to uh, cooperatively come to understand an idea, and I think that you know I'm certainly no no handmaiden to art. Uh, I think psychologists and or scientists generally and philosophers can can learn a lot from each other. Part of that is the culture of my department. So I have in my department people like Elliot Sober, who is actively involved with biologists, and and Dan Hausman, who works with economists. So uh, philosophy, as I understand it, is is almost an applied field. I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer to your question. Uh, uh. I understand. I, I I don't expect a satisfactory <laughs> answer because I think we are in uh, in a kind of changing uh, our practice as philosophers. But uh, one thing that characterizes philosophy, for example, is some uh, special preoccupations or uh, interrogations, like for example, metaphysical uh, interrogations, uh, uh, when uh, to me, for example, the, the big problem continues to, to, to be what we mean by mind 
in what relation of mind and our experience life. And uh, for example, uh, uh, embodied cognitivist, embodied cognitivists, can I uh, call them like There's this? There's no good no. name for them. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> it was one of the frustrations writing the book. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, the point is uh, functionalism and embodied cognition, for example. Embodied cognition suppose, take as a assumption, that experience is something that uh, have an existence, oh. and their problem is uh, mind is not only our experiential uh, life. Uh, but it is within a body and with a body, and it's not only brain, but it's body, and it's more than this. Uh, and functionalism uh, is something like a Hokanist project that uh, we don't want to speak uh, or talk about uh, immaterial things or mind. And, and so uh, uh, I think the problem between them is the problem of the status or the nature of uh, mind, experience, qualia, etc. This is my uh, preoccupation. And so uh, this is my second question. Is uh, You see that uh, embodied cognition can reveal something about uh, experience, the nature of our experience uh, scientifically. Uh, and by experience, you mean probably a phenomenal experience. I think, uh, you know, one common criticism of functionalism is that the functionalist can't, can't capture qualitative states because you can imagine physically identical organisms, one of, but with spectra inverted relative to each other, right? So my reds appear to me as as your greens appear to you, and yet we're, you're functionally identical. Uh, and what the functionalist has typically done at this point is they said, not all mental states are functional. Some are, are qualitative. Uh, they're the, the explanation for them comes from the very nature of the brain, something like that. I don't know if that's right, but it seems to me that if it were right, then that would uh, that would want one to take sides with an embodied approach rather than a functional approach for understanding qualitative states, because it's the functionalist as much as concedes that it's to the brain and the actual material of the brain that we need to look to understand qualitative states. So, uh, I I had a question, but now I don't know if I, <laughs> I see what my question is. Because of this discussion between you and, and Marcos, I'm wondering if uh, one of the things with one of the most important uh, aspect of the traditional explanation in, in philosophy. Modern, modern philosophy is to uh, point to the individual, to, to, to the subject, to, to, to a single mind, and to look what's happening there. So in your explanation now, it seems like you, you bring that kind of, of, of way of uh, making questions to functionalism as well. So let's see, in the body but of one person, in his body, what is going on in order for us to explain. And perhaps an alternative to that is to think that some phenomena that is going on between us, humans, and other animals as well, is very, very close related to interaction. So it's not possible to explain those phenomena in terms of a single individual. And that would be another step 
far from the Cartesian uh, perspective. What's your comment on that? Um, yeah, so I was mentioning to Flavio some of this work uh, by Edwin Hutchins, who wrote a book called Cognition in the Wild. And what Hutchins did was um, get permission to join the Navy on a long voyage, and he stayed in the in the cockpit and watched the interactions of the navigator, the pilot, uh, and all the other people involved in running the ship. And he was arguing that the way to understand the operation of the ship is by thinking of the different people performing these different operations as together creating a kind of cognitive system. Uh, I have, I'm kind of ambivalent about that. I'm not sure you need to take that that step. But one one thing that I do want to, a distinction I do want to make for helping me to, to answer your question is, is that one I made between constituents and causes. Okay, so um, it's true that many of us, I mean, we're all the time interacting with each other's with each other, and, and the results of our interactions certainly have effects on how we do things. So, uh, um, as, as I was saying earlier, I, I'm incapable of remembering the schedules of my two teenage daughters because they have to be 13 different places each day and at different times. And if I put the time in, I could maybe do it. But I've discovered it's much easier if I just ask my wife where they, they are. And so you might think that my beliefs about my children's schedules I put in my wife's head so that they don't clutter up my own head. Uh, but whether we think of those as a part of my mind or as simply her utterances as causal influences on my mind, I think is is not a question that has a right or wrong answer. And what I'm where I want to tread carefully is in making claims that seem to be unresolvable, uh, requiring stipulations about whether that that thing outside me is really a part of me or just a causal influence on me. So I, I have no objection, I think, to the way you want to describe things, except to say that it seems to be a choice you're making whether to regard these individuals as as part of you or as simply causal influences on you. Thank you for your uh, talk. It was very enlightening. Uh, I told you this morning, early this morning, that I'm, I'm very new in this uh, discussion, uh, especially in uh, embodied cognition. Uh, I started my uh, readings in philosophy of mind with uh, Dennett uh, Chalmers and uh, some of these uh, philosophers. And I have two questions, uh, and both of them are uh, about some, uh, some I, can, I may call a compatibility between embodied cognition and two other traditions. The first uh, question is about the possible proximity between embodied cognition and uh, the, the com computational theories. Because I, I, I just started reading your book, Embodied Cognition, and I, I just uh, realized that there is some issues between these two traditions, but uh, I think they are compatible. I think they are not uh, so uh, far from each other. So I would like to have your position about this uh, possible compatibility between these uh, two traditions. traditions. And uh, the second, second question is about uh, the Darwinian perspective 
because uh, reading Dennett especially and some some other uh, authors not from philosophy as Stephen Pinker for example uh, their background is the Darwinian reading their own reading so my question is and I am very convinced about uh, about this Darwinian background after uh, reading their books so I would like to ask you if uh, you see some uh, proximity between this Darwinian uh, background or perspective and uh, the embodied cognition. I mean, uh, do you think uh, that it's possible that the, the embodiment has uh, a Darwinian uh, 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 background, something like that? I mean, uh, uh, is it possible for us to explain the embodiment having uh, the Darwinian perspective as uh, a kind of explanation for for it to happen? Yeah. Okay, the first question is a question about the compatibility between the computational theory of mind and embodied cognition. And I, my, my view is of the three topics in embodied cognition, conceptualization, constitution, and replacement. Re replacement is the one that's most explicitly uh, uh, rejecting computationalism. They think that the, the vocabulary of computationalism, a vocabulary that includes things like algorithms, symbol symbolic representation, central processing units, they think this is the wrong, concept, wrong set of conceptual tools for understanding cognition, and rather they'd want to just focus on uh, differential equations with various parameters in order to talk about the dynamics involved in, in behavior. But um, as I suggested, the only reason why I think this replacement might succeed is if you also change the, the very subject matter of interest. So cognitive psychologists aren't interested in, in finger wagging. Uh, they might be interested in, in the, uh, in the uh, programs that are in charge of operating the muscles, but then you can't use differential equations to understand those because those are, are mental. I think that replacement has sort of abandon the mental in favor for something that lends themselves to these differential equations. So it's, it's a challenge, but it's a challenge that makes sense only because they've already changed the subject matter. Um, constitution, the claims of extended cognition, I think, are consistent with computationalism because, uh, as, as I mentioned, computationalism is a it's, it's neutral with respect to exactly what objects count as figuring into the computations. So an example I didn't discuss is um, uh, auditory perception. Our, our ears are about six inches apart. And because our ears are about six, six, six inches apart, there's a sound over there that will reach my right ear before it will reach my left ear. And so the shape, the size of our head makes a difference to our auditory acuity. If I had a really small head, I wouldn't be able to detect with as much refinement uh, the distance of sounds as if I had a really big head. Uh, so crickets solve this problem by having their ears on their legs because their legs are further apart than, than the size of their head. Now, this seems to be fact about our bodies, the size of our head, that makes a difference to some perceptual capacity, auditory perception. But this doesn't mean that um, our head has to be thought of as a constituent in the perceptual system. Rather, the algorithms that we use to describe auditory perception have to take as a value something like distance between the ears. But that's consistent with computationalism. Uh, it's just the algorithm has to accommodate that. So that's, in a way, saying, yes, bodies matter, but recognizing that doesn't mean we have to give up computationalism. 
Um, and then finally, conceptualization seems to me um, also compatible with with computationalism. Um, there the idea is it's a similar one that even if our conceptual repertoire is in some sense body relative, that doesn't mean that the facts about the body to which our conceptual repertoire is sensitive couldn't be represented in a way that um, made itself available to algorithmic computations. Uh, your second question was about the, the, the influence of Darwinism on embodied cognition. And in fact, some people in the embodied cognition program have been very influenced by Darwinian thinking. There's a philosopher named Mark Rollins who has claimed that natural selection will prefer uh, cognitive solutions that minimize the amount of cognitive effort on the part of the agent. And they do this by building Darwinian processes, will build agents that are able to use the environment to sort of offload information that would otherwise um, have to be contained in the head. So human beings are exceptional at using the environment in ways that simplify the cognitive tasks that would otherwise overwhelm us. So just to take a, a simple example, if you go to a library, a personal library, you'll order the books alphabetically. That's one strategy, and it's a good one for being able to find a book quickly. If you just put the books on the shelf randomly, you'd have to memorize where they all were in order to know that uh, you know the Rawls is here and the Descartes there. Right? So imagine now that natural selection has a choice between two organisms. One which is unable to use its environment in ways that would simplify its cognitive tasks, and the other that's learned some very simple strategies and rules so that it can use the environment in ways that enable it to simplify its cognitive load. Well, selection will favor the second kind of organism. That's the idea. And it's that second kind of organism that's sort of extending its cognition into the environment. Um, that's the argument. I have, a, I have a paper that appeared in Philosophy of Science a year ago or so pointing out some problems with that way of marrying Darwinian theory to, to embodied cognition. But I'm just offering that as a kind of example of the ways that some people have allowed Darwinism to inform their thinking about embodied cognition. Sure. Just to hear your comment on that, what would be, uh, what do you think if we could say that computationalism is about replicating in a machine the world and the way we move or anything you want? So we don't have to give up to that. Of course, there is lots of useful things we can do with that kind of representation description and re uh, machine representation of what we do and where we live in. But uh, it can contribute not very much in uh, give us, giving us a picture of how we humans really function. So that would be a way not to put computationalism uh, uh, in the trash, <laughs> but <laughs> to, to say something, but not in a philosophical, important, and relevant way which I think is exactly what was wrong in the tradition. They put computationalism as the main model for explaining what we are. So what would be your comment on that? Um, what you're saying reminds me of this distinction that John Searle drew in his famous Mind, Brains, and Programs paper, where Searle begins the paper distinguishing weak artificial intelligence from strong artificial intelligence. The weak artificial intelligence is, is the idea that we can use computers to help us understand the mind, to model aspects of the mind, with no commitment to the claim that 
minds just our computers. Where strong AI is the thesis that um, a suitably programmed computer would think because thinking simply is computation. Um, and and I'm not sure what I think. I think that um, I, I think I'm very impressed with the fruitfulness and progress that the computational theory of mind has generated over the past decades. Uh, and you, in a way, you, you can't argue with success. And much of this success comes from actually conceiving of the mind as a kind of program that works on some symbolic inputs. Now, if, if, if the mind acts like a computer, and our best explanations of it are computational, and our predictions about it depend on thinking of them as computers, it's like the, the adage, if it, if it quacks like a duck and walks like a duck and flies like a duck, it's a duck. So uh, I think at least, at least some aspects of cognition, I think it makes sense to describe as computational. But that said, I think there are different ways of viewing what computation is. So I think that the connectionism, the parallel distributed processing that developed in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, rightfully um, took the steam out of a lot of the very more uh, old-fashioned ways of viewing computation, the stuff coming out of Newell and Simon and, and Fodor and Pilishin. I think the term computation is subject to a lot of interpretations. And we might be able to agree on some form of computation that pleases both of us. Uh, I'm not as wedded to the, the Fodorian picture of computation as involving a, a CPU and, 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 and discrete symbols. I, I think a lot of the computation is better understood from the perspective of that that network I showed you with all these input nodes and, and the hidden layer and the, and the output nodes. It's still computation because it still involves processing representations, but it's not computational in the same way that what my computer is doing is computational. So, thank you very much, Larry. So, we will have a break now for um, lunch and I invite all to, to go now to the it, it's the student uh, the main restaurant. okay the main restaurant, the main restaurant. okay thank you very much thanks for having me Good fun. <laughs>